All right then, so in previous videos, we've focused a lot upon some projections of one-dimensional objects to one-dimensional objects. Now, although they're very mathematically interesting, it's going to be a lot more sort of useful for us now to consider high dimensional projective transforms. So now we're going to start looking at projections from the plane to the plane. And so we're really working in higher dimensional space because if you recall, for example, when we were talking about projections from the line to the line, we had to think about things in two dimensional space. We had to think about things outside of a line. And similarly, in thinking about projections from a plane to a plane, we also think about it in a three dimensional setting. And in fact, this has much to do with optics and perspective drawing and such. Imagine that you are a painter um, who's looking at a circle on the ground and imagine somehow you've got some ropes and pulleys or something and you're in the air and you're wanting to paint on this slanted canvas what you see. So there's going to be rays of light exuded and you can draw a ellipse on your canvas in this kind of manner. This is a natural sort of perspective drawing idea. And one can also see that in three dimensions you can have a projection of a ellipse which looks like a parabola. Okay, so, so far we've been viewing these pictures as if the artist has a kind of canvas and they're basically just drawing where they see beams of light coming from this object on the ground through their canvas. But we could imagine a different scenario and it's quite useful to think of uh, these physical things, I reckon. Um, so, instead, suppose that the ground was some kind of um, photoelectric plate or photographic film plate or something which, which has a chemical reaction with light and shows light, shows where light has hit it. And imagine that the artist is there with a laser pen and they can see this glass window with this ellipse in front of them and they're going to get their laser pen and they're going to shine it around the sort of uh, where they can see this ellipse. So that's going to cause this laser to basically project these beams of light um, down onto this ground and essentially sketch from a distance the projection of the ellipse onto the ground, okay? So in this case, we'd be saying that the artist would be projecting the ellipse onto the ground and making a parabola. Now, what about this case? This is rather interesting. We've already seen that in perspective, a circle or ellipse can appear as a parabola. But here what we're seeing is that it can also appear as a hyperbola. Imagine that this artist is at this point and they're looking to the right and they are using, you know, they're sending out these beams of light, perhaps with a laser pen or something. Um, and they are essentially projecting this ellipse onto the ground. Now, it just happens that because of their position, um, their beams of light, some of them are going to end up going through this ellipse fine and causing parts of this parabola to appear on the ground. But there are going to be other places on the ellipse. They're above the kind of angle of the ground and so when this artist shines their laser pen through these points the laser pen just sort of or the ray of light just goes off into infinity and you, you might say that nothing happens but 
here we're breaking from our physical analogy and going to the idea of projective geometry because we basically have a fancy way of justifying why the other uh, what's it called? The other branch of the hyperbola appears on the opposite side of the picture on the ground. We can imagine that these rays that the artist fires, which are too high to go onto the ground at the right, but pass through this ellipse, well, what they could do is they can go off to infinity and return at the other side of a picture from below and then create a projection, uh, which basically looks like the other branch of the hyperbola. And this makes total sense in terms of our kind of rules of projective space. You see, much as we thought of two parallel lines meeting at infinity at some, say, infinitely large circle at infinity, in the 2D case, well, when we're thinking about projective 3D space, we imagine that parallel planes meet at infinity and parallel lines meet at infinity. So what's going on? Well, what we really think of is that there's an infinite sphere. Um, there's a sort of sphere at infinity. And so parallel planes will meet at a kind of line or great circle on this sphere at infinity. Um, and by that kind of reasoning, it's completely okay for a piece of light to go off to infinity and return from the other side and thus create the hyperbola. Okay, so we're interested in projections from the plane to the plane. And it's looking like we're gonna have to consider things in three dimensions. In fact, We'll find out later that we don't always have to do that and there's some ways to keep things in the plane. But it certainly helps to begin with to um, think about this in 3D because it's a sort of more complete picture of what's going on. So let's now consider a kind of analogy of the case we've been looking at before. So the case we were looking at before was where we would have a projection of one line to another line. A projection, say, consisting of two perspectives. So we would have an original object. We would have one point of perspectivity, um, which would create an image of that object on a kind of intermediate line. And then we'd have another point of perspectivity which would translate the thing on the intermediate line into a kind of final image on a final line. So we went from one line to another line to another line. Okay, a two stage projection in two dimensions of a line. Now we're gonna look at a two stage projection of, uh, in three dimensions. So basically, this is the kind of picture we have. We have some object drawn on the plane and we have a, well, it's an ellipse in this case. And we have a perspective point O dash. We'll call the ground plane V. And let's suppose that there's a, ellipse k dash which is drawn on this ground plane and let's also suppose that there's a canvas uh, or another plane if you like which we shall call w which is let's say perpendicular it doesn't have to be perpendicular but it's somehow tilting upwards from the ground and our first stage is to do a perspective from this conic k dash this ellipse onto this canvas w from this perspective point o dash so this is kind of like the first stage of our transformation 
And it's similar to what I was talking about before. Uh, we just see where these rays go through this plane and mark them out. So we see we get an ellipse in this case. And now what we do is we do the second stage of this transformation. Now what that consists of is taking a second point of perspective and seeing where this object ends up getting sent to back down on the plane again. So again, we're thinking a bit like we were about the hyperbola of the artist kind of sending out rays that somehow mark out positions on the ground again. So basically now we have this second perspective point O dash dash and it's been eyed from this point um, the um, ellipse on W has been eyed at this point and we can see that it's going to end up creating a parabola sorry a hyperbola on the plane V on the ground plane just as before a few important things to note here. Firstly, by this process, which is really sort of actually two perspectives in 3D, we can really think of it just in terms of 2D stuff because the net effect of it is just to transform this ellipse on the ground plane V into a hyperbola on the ground plane V. And there's a, two more very important things to notice. One is about this canvas. So what I was calling this canvas, this uh, W, this kind of intermediary plane. Notice that this will cut, this plane will cut the ground plane V at a line. And we're going to call that line little o. Sometimes we may refer to it as the periphery. Now it's important to realize that this line, the points on this line are going to be fixed under this transformation. Hopefully you can see that by the drawing. Points on that line are always going to get sent to other points on that line. Um, the, they might move around on that line, but the line itself will never move. Secondly, the if you look at the perspective points O dash and O dash dash, if you draw a line straight through those two points, that's going to pierce the ground plane V at a particular point that we'll call O. So this line little O is sometimes referred to as the periphery. It's a fixed line under this transformation. And this point big O is sometimes referred to as the center. That's a fixed point under this transformation. Now, it would be kind of cumbersome if each time we wanted to think about a projection from the plane to itself, we had to go into 3D and make all these big pictures and stuff. And it turns out that there's a lovely idea called the idea of a homology, which basically allows us to think about this whole process inside the plane. Now, a homology then is defined as a transformation of the plane such that whenever we have a fixed point and when, whenever we have a line that goes through that fixed point, if there's a point on such a line so imagine this ray for a fixed point with, say, this uh, other point on it. Well, that other point is going to get sent to somewhere else on that same ray, on that same line. So we could say it more concisely. We could just say that all points move along lines of a fixed point. So given any fixed point, draw a line through it, look at any points on that line. When you do your homology, that point will go to another place or maybe the same place on that line. It won't move off that line. And also, kind of the jewel of this is that 
whenever we have a fixed line, any other line which goes through that fixed line and meets at a particular point, well, that's going to get transformed into some other line which also goes through that same point. So we're interested in homologies, which is essentially these transforms from the plane to themselves, because they're all about, they're so closely related with the idea of projections. And so how do we actually go about doing a homology? Is there a way to do it using the standard tools of projective geometry? I say, uh, uh, maybe I should just say tool. I mean, we only really use a straight edge. So can we do it? Well, we can. Um, so to carry out a homology transform, um, there's a kind of very simple recipe. You choose a center, big O, that could be thought of as the place that the system's been viewed from, but whatever. Um, and we choose a kind of periphery, little o, which is a line, which in some sense might be thought of as a horizon. Now, also, we take a point x dash, and we're going to send that to another point x dash dash. And we're going to do it in such a way that it moves the x dash and x dash dash, the line through them, meets this origin, meets this center point. Um, so basically, we like to have this idea that our points are getting moved along lines that go through this center. That's one of our homology rules, right? So basically, now we've got the ingredients down and essentially defined the entire homology. So let's just recap. We've defined a center. That's a point, big O. I'll draw a squiggle on it to differentiate it. We've got a periphery. That's a line. And we have, given that one point is x dash, is transformed into another point x dash dash. Now what do we do? Well, Let's now say that we have some other point y dash and we're interested in finding out where that gets sent to in our homology. So the other important thing to consider is that let's say we draw a line through x dash and y dash. Well, that's a given line and it's going to meet with our periphery somewhere. Let's say a point p. Well, in that case, the image of that line, if you like, which is going to be the line through x dash dash and y dash dash, must also meet the periphery at P. Now, this is the crux of it, really, because what we're saying is that um, essentially the action of this homology is to kind of spin around this line which originally went through x dash and y dash and finally ends up going through x double dash y double dash if we spin that line around p that's um, kind of one of the things our homology does so we can now sort of turn it around we can say well given that we know how x dash goes to x double dash and we know about where the origin or center big O is, and we know about where the periphery little o is. Well, and we know where the object y dash is. Well then, 
how can we find the image of the object y dash? How can we find y double dash? Well, we can just use the information that we already have, in fact. Maybe you'd like to pause the video and think about it. So now we can basically find the image y double dash quite easily. All we have to do is, firstly, um, we'll draw a line through the center, big O, and through y dash, because we know that the image has to be on that line. And secondly, we're going to draw another line, which And so basically then, what we have is that y double dash is going to be the intersection of this um, line from our center through y dash with the line that goes from x double dash to p. Okay, so in practice, once we have our periphery and our center of perspective and we have a transformation of one point we can go on and find the transformations of other points and in fact we can do that with respect to i any of the transformations we've already seen this is a actual consequence of de Zarg's theorem so let's say now we had a third point z dash so supposing we wanted to find out the image of z dash say z dash dash well we could you we could do that uh, by considering the movement of x dash to x dash dash or equivalently we could do it by considering the movement of y dash to y dash dash that's a consequence of de Zarg's theorem in fact so Let's look at an example where we have a center of perspective big O, we have an origin little o, and we have a circle. And so let's say we've got a point one on this circle, and we know that that gets mapped to another point one dash under this homology so can we then determine where this point two gets mapped to under the homology well yes we can just using our formula before we know that it's going to get mapped to the place that we get by drawing a line from the center of perspective through two we know it's going to be on that line and we also know it's going to be on the line we get if we link up two so we also know that it's going to be on this line we get if we join one and two on the original circle and find out where they meet the periphery. So we'll call that point P. Well then, we know that under our homology, that line is going to be transformed into a line which goes through the images of one and two. So we know that um, the image of two is going to end up lying upon that line which goes from the image of one, which we call one dash, and also through this point P. So basically then now we know that the image of two is gonna just be the intersection of this line we get from drawing from the periphery, sorry, from the center of perspective through two and intersecting that with this line we get from joining the image of one through this uh, place of meeting the periphery line P.
and we can okay so we can continue this process and we can find out the image of our circle and we can do many other very interesting things with this idea of homology I mean basically much as we combined perspectives together to get projections we may do several of these kind of homology operations 